Check, check. One, two, check. All right, good evening. Where's Faye? Faye's not here tonight. Hmm. Beverly down east, Ed. Did she? Oh, did he come up with her? Oh, cool. Good. Excuse me? Okay. Hi, Giggles. Oh, the, isn't there any class for you tonight? Huh? Oh, at camp. Oh, and you have to sit up with the boring adults tonight. <laughs> hey, you want to help me teach tonight? Oh, okay. <laughs> she thought about it. She thought about it. Hi, Noreen. Hi, Allison. Hi, Braden. Hi, Mike. Okay, welcome to our Bible study, Wednesday night. The shot in the arm in the middle of the week. I love it. I love it. And I love that you're here, and I love that you love it. Just a couple things before we get into our lesson and go to prayer. Baptism services and new member services. Baptism services and new member services are August the 21st. If you have never been baptized, or if you have been baptized, and you were a, a child or an infant, or you were sprinkled, or whatever the deal was with your baptism, and you're not sure, I mean, you're confused about maybe why you were baptized, um, come see me. We'll talk about it. And uh, I'm not um, looking for people to dunk in the lake. Um, but if baptism is important, uh, it's not a requirement of salvation, uh, I don't believe. I believe God, uh, through Jesus himself, speaks pointedly about it, uh, that the Christian should be baptized. Um, but I know one in the New Testament that hung on the cross, and he wasn't baptized, and he went to heaven. So if you've never been baptized or you um, have been baptized as a child uh, and would like to consider being baptized, um, please see me, and I'll need those forms. Uh, the forms are at either one of the welcome centers, and I'll need those filled out, read and filled out, and I don't know why that's still playing. Um, I forgot my clicker to my office, and I forgot to turn that off. Hmm. Okay, um, but uh, fill those forms out and get those to me um, as soon as possible. Also, if you're not a member uh, of the church and you'd like to become a member of the Beavertown Bible Church, uh, the only requirement is that you be a Christian. And uh, there's a form at the Welcome Center here, and the Welcome Center I hear it tells you all of the, uh, the re quote unquote requirements and uh, what we can uh, look for look uh, look at from you in regards to what membership is so uh, I encourage you to to take a look at that if you if you're not a member and also I put out a an announcement yesterday uh, in regards to daily devotions um, that will begin on August the 15th I will start them on August the 15th this Sunday morning uh, coming up um, there will be a, a box out here, a clear plastic box 
and it should have a should have a tag on top of it that says uh, devotion sign up there will be forms there i'll have maddie make them up tomorrow be forms for that you fill out your email address put your name on it and stick it in that box and i'll collect them and that box will be there for as long as people want to uh sign up if they don't sign up right away they can sign up later or if they miss the sunday or whatever they can sign up so uh, it'll take place sign ups will begin this sunday devotions will begin this uh next month on the 15th uh did everyone receive um did you guys get or most of you get the, the email i sent out today about the missions missions report how many of you have emails raise your hand how many of you be honest regularly check your emails every day okay all right well check your email because i sent them out uh, this morning and i was having a little bit of problem doing that but i was able to get them out uh, to you uh, this morning so for july's missionaries and praise uh, reports okay um, let me fix the screens since we don't have a sound guy let me fix the screen and get my pointer and then we will continue with our prayer list <clears throat> guys keep asking me if i've had anybody inquire about running the sound booth and i have i had one person inquire said he would like to do that so that will increase our numbers to three so working too boy that's a bonus does anyone have any questions on baptism membership or devotions okay prayer requests tonight anyone prayer or praise God's not working huh wow he must be slumbering and sleeping That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Beverly, if you're watching at home, uh, that comment came from Noreen. And <laughs> she said, Where are you at? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. I sent him another card this week. Have any of you seen Skip in his new shirt? You haven't seen, some of you haven't seen Skip in his new shirt. Skip's right out there in the lobby, <clears throat> and I know he hears, oh, oh, he's running for the front door. He's, he's going for the door. He's going for the exit. Skip, look, look at Skip's shirt. Look at, look at his shirt. Look at his shirt. It says, says says free hugs says just kidding don't touch me <laughs> and for all of you uh, who know that skip really loves hugs so <laughs> eileen gave him one here this evening and i couldn't tell where skip's head was because it was the same color as her shirt so yeah anyone else anyone ha yes She's coughing. Yeah, her and Steve passing around the virus in their home, Steve and Joyce Kelly.
Yes, Noreen. He put himself in today. Cystic fibrosis. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Skip. He's on there. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey, keep me in your prayers tomorrow night. I'm going with three Philly fans to a pirate game. <laughs> and, and I'm the only pirate fan. But I'm, but I'm driving, so <laughs> I'll kick them out. <laughs> Karen won't say anything, will you, Karen? No. What's that? They got Uber. <laughs> <laughs> If there are no more praises or no more prayers uh, requests, do they only have a praise, uh, a testimony? Yes, Patty. Yes, amen. That is a praise. Praise God for that. That you and Bill get to spend more time with your granddaughter and you get to bring her to church. Anyone else? Yes, Wendy. It's okay. We have an hour. <laughs> If we believe, <clears throat> and I know you do, that if you believe God is sovereign, I know you believe that, right? Then there are no coincidences. There are no coincidences with a sovereign God. I, I, maybe it was Rick that said this years ago in Pastor Jim's Bible study. I, I don't remember. I, th I think it was Rick, somebody, and, and I have always remembered it. I heard it because I was sitting where you are. But he said there isn't a blade of grass that doesn't move in the wind that God doesn't know about it altogether. Think about that. So, so our prayers are important. They are. God wants to hear his children cry out to him. And, uh, and he's wonderful because, <clears throat> not just because of this, but he's, he's wonderful in that he lets us, he lets us in, he lets us in to his working and lets us see glimpses of things like that to know that wow this is this is only of him and uh, it, it's a blessing so thank you for sharing that anyone else yes bill yes it, it is, Bill. It's not quite the same as being here, but, but it's still nice that you have the opportunity to do that in it. And I missed you. I missed you, and you weren't here. I missed you. Somebody else had Sharon. Really? Wow. Well, praise the Lord for that. Amen. 
This is good. Anybody else? Anyone else? Okay, unspoken request. Any more requests or any, any more testimonies, praises? Anyone? Pandafino, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's bow our hearts together as we go to Lord in prayer. Father, we, we come before you this evening and we thank you for the testimonies that were shared here tonight. There are no coincidences with you. <laughs> there aren't. Um, you orchestrate everything. You're behind everything. Even the enemy's actions. He has no power over any of us unless you give it to him. And that's hard for us to wrap our mind around that. Yet, it's true. We thank you for your all-knowing. We thank you for knowing our thoughts and our burdens, our pains, our weights, our prayers, our supplications before, long before they ever enter into our, our mind and into our heart, before we ever utter them up in prayer, you already know them. You know all of our tears. In fact, the Bible says you have them kept in a bottle. <laughs> it's like the psalmist. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain unto it. You're God of heaven. You're the star maker the star hanger. Tonight as we move about through your word, <clears throat> give us our portion tonight, Lord. Open our eyes that we might see. Bless us in ways that only you can bless us and cause us, Lord, to meditate, to fill our mind with your precepts and your truths and your words. The Bible says, blessed is the man who does this. It's easy not to <clears throat> because we're so focused, we're so consumed in our world, in the things that are happening daily <clears throat> across the globe here in America Biden sends 20 more million barrels sells 20 more million barrels overseas Lord you're not sitting in heaven grumbling and biting your fingernails help us to trust you I praise praise you that <clears throat> our hope is not found in the White House but is found in the, the one who sits on the throne. One throne. Not many. Not different levels of cabinet and office, but one. And tonight our hope is found in you. Not just tonight, but tonight as we pray, our hope is found in you. We pray for our list this evening thank you for Beverly and that she's home and that her dad's with her this evening we praise you for Lucas I got to spend a little bit of time with Lucas on Friday and uh, I just pray you continue to bless him I pray for that family for Kenny and his wife and the rest of the boys praise you for Steve and Wanda that they're here they're over COVID and Steve's got a Z-Pack now battling a sinus infection we pray for that for Steve and Joyce Kelly who <clears throat> Joyce would be here, but she's coughing and trying to get herself better so she can 
do whatever she can to make herself feel better so she can be here on Sunday, no doubt. For Jeff Dobson, cystic fibrosis, we pray for him. The unspoken needs. For Frankie uh, Pandolfina, who's coming to the end of his life, no doubt. He's a fighter. But, oh, Lord, he loves you. Frankie has a Frankie has quite a story and how you rescued him when he was drowning and you pulled him to safety because he cried out, Lord, save me. Thank you for Frank's life. Thank you for his testimony. I pray for Mandy and the kids. And uh, I know whenever it's your time uh, to take Frank, uh, he'll be ready. But we commit this family into your precious hands tonight. Go with us now as we go through our lesson. We read the scriptures. May your scriptures speak to us in ways that only your word can. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> we are in Second Kings. We are in chapter nine and we have come down as far as verse eight in our <clears throat> study Elisha had gone to second Kings nine is that verse one yeah I wonder why I didn't take that out of there I don't know. Let me get to verse 8. Is that 8? Okay. Oh, my gosh. I did. That's twice in a row. Well, you get them. They're on my desk. Thanks, Matt. Huh? <laughs> Gone. Yeah, that's what Gary. Gary Weiser said that to me in Sunday school. I had a thought, <clears throat> and it it just has any has that ever happened to you guys? You have a thought, and then pew, gone. I had a thought, I had an idea, and I said to thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thanks. I said, oh, no. No, it just, wow, I can see people. <laughs> I said, uh, I, said I, I, I forgot, and I put my head down, and I heard this one lonely, low voice. He said, gone, gone. And I looked up, and I said, who said that? And Patsy went, <laughs> Patsy gave Gary up right away. And I said, Gary, did you say that? She says, only because he can relate. <laughs> but it just left me. So, <clears throat> Elisha, where we are here this evening, Elisha called for one of the sons of the prophets, one of the children of the prophets, <clears throat> was to take some oil, and he was to go to Ramoth Gilead. And when he got to Ramoth Gilead, <clears throat> he was to go find a man named who? Uh-huh. Four letters, starts with a J, second letter is an E, third letter is an H, and then a U. Jehu. I gave that away, didn't I? He was supposed to go <clears throat> find Jehu, uh, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, not Jehoshaphat the king. There's two Jehoshaphats. And I know last week as we were going through some of this, you guys were like, I saw it. You were like, what is he saying? Because I don't remember all these names, and I'm confused. So I encourage you to read it. <clears throat> Maybe it'll make more sense to you. So one of the children of the sons of the prophets was supposed to take some oil, go up and find Jehu, and was supposed to go in and pull him aside from his brothers and anoint him with oil. And he did that. He went into the, uh, the captain, where the captains were of the host. They were sitting, and he came in, and he said, I have an errand. Um, 
O captain, I have an errand to give to thee. And Jehu said, to, to which one of us? And he said, to you. And he got up and he went into another room and he poured the oil on his head and he told him uh, that uh, the Lord God is anointing him king uh, over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And then he was told by Elisha that once he did that, once he poured the oil on, king, on Jehu's head, he was supposed to do what? What? Run away. Flee. He was supposed to go. Hightail it out of there. Why didn't, I asked you this last week, why didn't Elisha do this? Why do we think Elisha did not do this himself? Yeah, everywhere Elisha went, it brought people out. His name was so profound and prominent as the man of God. In fact, he didn't have to use his name, just calling him the man of God. It, it brought a lot of people. It brought a lot of attention to the areas that he would have been in. And so this, we didn't know it at the time when we were studying it last week, but now as we move on, as you read ahead and as you, as you learn a little bit, this, this whole thing had to happen under the radar for Jehu because Jehu is going to be, Jehu is commanded to do what? That's huge, huge. Remember, Jehu is an instrument of the Lord, and he's, he's going to be tasked with doing what? Yeah, killing Ahab's family. So it, it couldn't be a, burr, burr, burr. it couldn't be something that was blown out of a trumpet, something that, it had to be like a stealthy kind of a, a secret mission, so to speak. And <clears throat> in verse 7 of chapter 9, <clears throat> it says here, it, uh, th as, uh, as this uh, son of the prophet is speaking to Jehu, he says, you're going to smite the house of Ahab, your master, th that I may avenge the blood of my servant, servants and the prophets and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel, because Jezebel did what? She killed them. Every, all the prophets she could, she murdered them. In verse 8 here is where we, we, where we left off. And it says, For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. And I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall. That's King James language. Just another way of saying every male. Um, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. Verse 9 says, and I will make the house of Ahab like the house of, of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of uh, Baasha, and the, the son of Ahijah. And verse 10 says, and the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, in the area of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door, and then he took off. Now, I, two things here. One is, it's interesting, because if you read ahead, how many of you have read ahead? It's interesting, when you read ahead, the, the dogs are going to eat Jezebel's body. The only thing they don't touch is the hand, the hands, the feet, and the head. They eat everything else but the hands, the feet, and the hand feel like those are the instruments that she used to carry out her wickedness. I don't know. It's really, I don't know if there's a principle there or not, but I thought, why those three? Why the hands? Why the feet? Why the head? But he tells Jehu this in regards to Jezebel as he closes out, and then he flees. Now, why do you think he flees? Now, he was told to run out of there. He was instructed to run out of there. Why is he running out of there? Okay? One might think that. that. That's the first thing that I thought about is that he was feared, he's fearing his life, but he was instructed to do that. Anyone else? I don't, I don't necessarily think you're wrong, Patty. I, I think that that could be it. I'm just, and listen, I'm not trying to read into the scriptures. I want to know why he ran away. I want to know why he was instructed to run away. 
<laughs> he was on a tight schedule. He needed to get busy. He had, he had a lot of family to kill. He had a lot of family to slaughter. Linda, you were going to say something? He was instructed by Elisha, this is the message you're going to deliver, and then you get your butt out of there. You, you hightail it out. Yeah, he was a man of God. So, so he was doing it out of obedience. I think it's possible. All those are possible. I don't know for sure, but I'm not totally convinced that, that he's running for fear of Jehu cutting his head off. I, I always think that maybe there's a part of it that Elisha had him running for effect. For, for impact. For impact. I mean, he comes out of nowhere. Jehu comes out of, out of or this prophet comes out of nowhere. Um, he singles him out of everybody. He pours oil on his head. He gives the Lord's commission to him and, and you're going to be the king over my people, even Israel. This is your commission. This is what you're going to accomplish. You're going to kill all of Ahab's family. You're going to kill all of his dynasty. Jezebel's going to die. And, 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 and when he's done telling this, he, he turns around and he runs away. I really think that Jehu's probably thinking, what the heck happened to me? What, what just happened? What, what is this all about? What just took place? I, I think it was the impact that is, and I could be wrong about that. It, it could be anything, but I feel like this is the impact that, that was wanted to, to be given. So I, I don't know. It could have been for safety. Uh, it could have been for the other reasons that were mentioned, but it just seems like he was instructed to do this, and I believe that Elisha wanted this to be impactful. Let me ask you something. Do, do you think you might have been like Jehu? Oh, what, what's, going, what's this all about? I mean, think about that. I'm going to kill my master, his family? So, I don't know. But it says here in verse 11, then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord. Look at this. And one said unto him, are you okay? So do you think Jehu was frazzled? Do you think he looked a little different? This is why I think he, he, he is like, what, what's this all about? What's going on? They look at Jehu, he's frazzled, he's all oily, he's covered in oil, and he's, Jehu, are you, are you okay? Is all well? Wherefore, look, came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, You know the man and his communication. And what is Jehu saying here? You know the man. Jehu, are you okay? You guys know the man. And you know what he came here to say. What's Jehu thinking? Jehu's thinking, did you guys put him up to this? Did you guys, did you, you know what's going on. You guys did this. That's what he's thinking, okay? You with me? We're all on the same page? Wherefore came this mad fellow? Why, why did this crazy guy come to you? And he said unto him, you know the man. He's not a crazy man. You know who he is and his communication. You know what message he came to deliver. Verse 12, verse 12, and they said, it, it is false. Tell us now. And he said, thus and thus spake he to me, saying, thus saith the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, and uh, I have anointed thee king over Israel. All the oil dripping off of him was a dead giveaway. But they said, listen, Jehu, we didn't, we didn't do this. We, we didn't conspire. We don't know anything about this. Verse 13, then they hasted, and look here, and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs. So he was obviously on the second story. 
and blew the trumpets saying Jehu is king so he must have come out uh, a door at the top of a stairway on the second level and they blew the horn Jehu is king or or literally Jehu reigneth okay and by the way he will reign in Israel for 28 years Jehu look at verse 14 so Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat the son of Nimshi conspired against Joram now Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead he and all of Israel because of Haziel king of Syria Joram Joram is one of the offspring of who? Joram is one of the offspring of who is Jehu to kill his family? Ahab he is one of the offspring of Ahab and, and this is what I have to do and he kept it says he kept Ramoth Gilead and, and it's because it was the front of the war so alright any thoughts or comments everybody know where we are verse 15 but King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Haziel king of Syria and Jehu said if it be your minds then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel so if you're with me in this then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel. And, and this is what, it's like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what the prophet said. And if you guys are with me, that's what he's saying here. If it be your minds, if you guys are with me, my responsibility is to deal with Joram because he's an offspring of Ahab and the house of Ahab and if you guys are with me I want you I want you look at it look then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go tell it in Jezreel I want you to keep a lid on it see th this is important because if Elisha would have came to tell this there wouldn't have been a lid on it so he says I'm going to head out but, but don't you let any get out of the city of Ramoth Gilead people heard you blowing the trumpet saying Jehu reigneth Jehu is the king you got to keep a lid on this until I get accomplished some of the things I need to do are there any comments any comments any thoughts okay so verse 16 Jehu rode in a chariot he got in his limousine and he went to Jezreel about 45 miles away for Joram lay there and he's laying there because he's recovering from his wounds and Ahaziah king of Judah was come down to see Joram and there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel and he spied the company of Jehu as he came and he said I see a company and Joram said take a horseman and send to meet them and let him say is it peace now we're going to have this is interesting I like this when this happens we're going to have the word peace from here right here where it says it is, is it peace we're going to have the word peace mentioned seven times in these next couple verses so Joram says go find out who it is and see if they come 
in peace. Verse 18. So there went one on horseback to meet him. Verse, uh, I'm slacking off here. I'm sorry. There went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, Joram, is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. <laughs> so what did Jehu just say to this messenger that was on horseback? What, what did he just tell him? Let's read it. What, what did he just tell him? So there went one on horseback to meet him, and he said, Thus saith the king. Joram wants to know, are you coming in peace? And Jehu said, what hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, the watchman that saw Jor the watchman was the guy in the tower. So the watchman told, told Joram, saying, the messenger that we sent out, he came to them, but he didn't come back. He didn't come back again. So basically, Jehu said this. There's no peace here. Fall into the rear and get behind me. And that's what he made him do. There, there's no peace here, boy. You want to live, you get to the back of the pack. Because Jehu didn't want the word of his purpose getting to Joram. If he'd have told him, that guy would have ran back. They would have had to kill him. So the other alternative was put him in the back of the, back of the row. So your messenger went. This watchman's on the tower says, your messenger went and met him, but he didn't return. He, he, he went to the rear of the line of, of, of his army. <laughs> Verse 19. Then he sent out a second on horseback. Hey, let's do it again which came to them and said King Joram wants to know are you coming in peace thus, thus saith the king is it peace and Jehu answered what hast thou to do with peace turn thee behind me same thing right same thing same outcome verse 20 and the watchman told Joram saying he came even unto them he, he went to he went to uh, the, this, this group and he didn't come back and the driving look at this <laughs> the driving is like the driving of who Jehu the son of Nimshi for he driveth furiously the, the watchman says something happened the same thing happened as before but as they approach closer the driver drives like Jehu the son of Nimshi like a madman know anybody in your life that drives like a madman you could say hey, I'm not sure wait a minute yeah that, that person drives like so and so this guy's chariot he says chariot What's his chariot doing? I mean, it's just Jehu, the son of Nimshi, he, he drives like a man-man. What a reputation to have, all right? Reputation. Okay. Especially a chariot. That just blows me away. So the idea is he, he's driving, he's driving like a madman. He's driving with madness. He obviously had a great reputation as a warrior. He had a great reputation as a charioteer. Um, but this driving is one of the likes of Jehu. The, Jehu wasn't a, a quiet man. He was somebody who was noted, no, noted, noted uh, in the area. Anybody have any thoughts or comments? It's okay. Anybody? All right. All right, look at verse 21. And Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was, make, was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out 
against, or they went out face to face against Jehu and met him <clears throat> in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite. <laughs> okay? So how about this? Is, is everybody with me so far? You guys are with me. Okay. This is where Elijah said that they would die, by the way. Okay? Where Jezebel would be eaten by dogs. And they just happened to intersect in the portion of ground that belonged, look at it says, <clears throat> and they met him in the portion of what? Naboth, the Jezreelite. Who was Naboth? What's that? No. Jezebel's husband was Ahab. Naboth. Who was Naboth? He was the one, he was the one that had the vineyard. Yeah. And they, they're meeting him right there. Coincidence. Wendy's talking about coincidences tonight. Mm -hmm. Not just a coincidence. They're meeting them right there. And Naboth is the one that Ahab had killed to take his vineyard. And at this point, Joram is not doubting Jehu's loyalty. That's important. He's meeting with him face to face. He's not doubting his loyalty at this point in time. Um, he, had been, he had been one of his officers. So keep, keep that in mind. So they're meeting with him face to face at the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Naboth was the man who Ahab killed to steal his vineyard. But this is the very same place that Elijah said that they would die. Very, and, and so the lesson here is that God's word will pan out and work out exactly the way God says it's going to happen. Okay? Verse 22. And it came to pass, and it always does, came to pass when Joram saw Jehu, sorry, turn the, turn the channels here, <clears throat> that he said is it peace Jehu is it peace what's going on Jehu is there trouble on the Syrian front is, is everything okay Jehu is it peace and Jehu had answered what peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. What peace could we ever have as long as the whoredoms and witchcraft of your mother remain here? Kind of a giveaway that he didn't come in peace, right? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And, and so as we keep reading, peace seven times we need to realize that peace I feel like that peace isn't the absence of hostility keep that in mind peace is always the ruling of righteousness when, when the righteous rule there can still be hostility but also be peace um, when the ungodly rule, though there may be no hostility, there still isn't peace. Does that make sense? And he said, in the second part of verse 22, what peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. So, so what kind of peace can there be when, when we are infected by the whoredoms and the witchcraft of your mother. Verse 23. And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, who's the king of Judah, there is treachery, O Ahaziah. Verse 24. <clears throat> and Jehu drew a bow 
with his full strength and smote Jehoram, Joram, between his arms. And the arrow went out at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. Do you remember back in, let me see if it's on the screen. 1 Kings chapter 23. You can go back to 1 Kings 23. And verse 33 and verse 34. It says, And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel that they turned back from pursuing him and a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel that was Ahab between the joints of the harness wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot turn thy hand and carry me out of the host for I am wounded here here we just have pulls back and lets it fly here in our text here tonight and we get a direct hit by the way I said this whenever David was slinging stones at Goliath slung a stone at Goliath that if David would have pointed that sling the opposite direction that Goliath was standing in if Goliath was standing directly west of David and David would have been facing directly east and slung the stone, I believe that stone would have went, that stone would have went around the world and hit Goliath in the back of the head because it's controlled by God. I do. And I believe that's the case here. It's a God thing. He just, he just pulls back his bow. It says here in verse 24, he drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between the arms and the arrow sunk, went out of his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. One, um, one writer said this, the arrows of God may seem slow in coming. He says, but they always hit their mark. They always hit their mark. So Jehu pulls his bow back, and he hits he hits Joram. Look at verse 25. Is that 25? Oh, it says, Then said Jehu to Bidkar. Who's Bidkar? His captain. Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord said, the, the Lord laid this burden upon him. So, so he's saying evidently Jehu and Bidkar were officers whenever Ahab, uh, under Ahab, when Ahab was the king. And, and uh, uh, Joram's father um, was Ahab. And he said, do you remember when Ahab killed Naboth? And we were together, riding together. Um, and, and Elijah said this would be the very thing that happened. For remember how that, to, how that when, when you and I rode together under my father, uh, that after Ahab his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him, upon Elijah. So Elijah you know, said this very thing. This is exactly what would happen. Verse 26 <clears throat> it says, Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, saith the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. Things will always happen just the way God's word says it would happen. Elijah said this was going to happen exactly the way it happened. Now, if you want to read, um, well, let's, let's look at verse 27 here first. It says, But when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, when he saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house. 
And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up to Gur, which is by Ibleum. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. So if you go to Chronicles chapter 22, um, it will give you more detail about this here uh, with Ahaziah. It gives you all the details. So he, he's begun to wipe out the house of, of Israel, the house of Ahab, the house of his, his dynasty. He's, he's, taking, he's getting rid of it. Does anybody have any comments, questions? Anybody lost? You lost? Well, you went, to, you went to the bathroom. You missed half of it. What are you confused about? Jehu? What, what's that? Switch paths? How, how did it change stories? How did it switch paths? Jehu's the king, Jehu's the now the cool anointed king, and he's God's instrument, and he's going, he's going around killing every one of Ahab's uh, dynasty, his sons, his grandsons, his offspring. He is getting rid of all of them. That's what he's doing. Okay. Okay. That's, well, listen. If you don't understand and you're lost at some point say something because it's very easy to get lost and I don't want you to be lost so it's better to ask a question and there are no stupid questions because the only stupid question is one that's not asked Okay, so don't, don't be afraid to ask but if you want to read more about this you can go to Chronicles chapter 22 Second Chronicles 22 and it'll tell you more about it so he's begun wiping out the house of Ahab look at verse 28 says, and his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem, carried Ahaziah, and buried him. Jerusalem was where? North or south? South, very good. Yep, and Ahaziah was the king of the north or the south? South. So they, so they took Ahaziah, they carried his body down south, buried it in Jerusalem, and buried him in the sepulcher uh, with his fathers in the city of David. Verse 29. And in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign over, over Judah. So, so now this was what this verse is not out of place here, but in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaz Ahaziah is the one he just killed. The one that was taken down to Jerusalem and the one that was buried in the sepulcher with his fathers in the city of, of David. So um, he was the one that just was killed in verse 27. Verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tried tired I'm sorry and tired her head and looked out at a window the word tired means adorned so she painted when Jehu was come to Jezreel Jezebel heard of it and she painted her face and adorned her head and looked out a Window, the the phrase there in the Hebrew, she painted her face. It comes from a Greek word, which means to bring order out of chaos. I'm just kidding. You didn't get that, did you? Wow, she just put makeup on. Okay, she put makeup on. So he finally comes to city to the city, and. Jezebel hears about Jehu coming to the city and she paints her face. She puts on makeup. Now history says this about Jezebel that she, historically she was very beautiful. Very, very beautiful. 
Um, scholars are divided. Was she trying to seduce? Listen, I read them all. It seems like. Is, was she trying to seduce Jehu um, into making her queen? Or did she desire to die with her makeup on um, like some Phoenician queen um, in some way, some fashion? Um, but we don't know for sure. But she hears about Jehu coming and she goes and she fixes herself up. And he comments on Jezebel. Not yet. It, it was prophesied that she would be eaten by dogs. But if you skip down to verse 37, she was eaten by dogs. Verse 36 and 37, that's when she's eaten by dogs. Okay? So she, yeah, it was prophesied that she would be, but she wasn't yet. Anyone else? You think that's what she's doing? You, th you think she was a warrior like that? Yeah, I, I, I tend to side with you on that. I, a lot of people believe she was, she was going to try to seduce Jehu. But I don't know. About the prophecy, you mean? Oh, probably. Yeah, I, I would imagine probably that word got back to her. Yeah. Yeah, this, I mean, they didn't have... There was some time between this, Wanda. Uh, I'm sure she heard about it. And, and she, it says there, when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. Not, not just his coming, but probably heard about everything that had taken place. She's, she's got word. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. Look at verse 31. She's looking out a window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace? Who slew his master? Do you remember that? Does anybody remember that? Back in 1 Kings chapter, I guess I didn't put that in here. Look at, look at 1 Kings chapter 16. I don't have it on the screen. Look at 1 Kings 16 and look at verse 9. Let's read down through this here quick. We'll finish with this here this evening, this thought. It says, And his servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots. Now, if, if you go back up in the 20th and 6th year of Asa, king of Judah, Asa was a good king, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel in Terza two years. And his servant Zimri, captain of of half his chariots conspired against him as he was in Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Tirzah. And Zimri went in and smote him, his master, and killed him in the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his stead. And it came to pass when he began to reign as soon as he sat on the throne that he slew all the house of Beasha. He left him not one that pisseth against the wall, neither of his kinfolks nor of his friends. Thus did Zimri destroy all the house of Baasha, according to the word of the Lord, which, which he spake against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, by which they sinned and by which they made Israel to sin in provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did are they not written in the book of Chronicles and the kings of Israel. 
And in the 20 and 7th year of Asa king of Judah did Zimri reign seven days in Tirzah. And the people were encamped against Gibeathon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the people that were encamped heard say, Zimri hath conspired and hath also slain the king. That was Elah when he was drunk. Uh, wherefore all Israel made Omri the captain of the host king over Israel that day in the camp. And Omri went up from Gibeathon and all of Israel with him and they besieged Tirzah. And it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire and died for his sins which he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord in walking in the ways of Jeroboam and in his sin which he did to make Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his treason that uh, he wrought are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. So Zimri, Zimri had killed the king of Israel whenever he was drunk. He took the throne and then Zimri only reigned for seven days. And Omri burnt down the place um, se seven days uh, after. So, so she's yelling here, verse, four, uh, verse 31, she's yelling and she's looking out the window and Jehu entered into the gate and she said, had Zimri peace who slew his master? So she's yelling at Jehu, remember the last man who murdered his king or his master? He didn't last. He only lasted seven days. Maybe she's trying to shame him into, um, uh, into hesitancy or making her part of his cabinet. I don't know. But Jehu's not intimidated by her uh, at all because he, he's, he's got the word of the Lord through, through the prophet, and he knows exactly what he is to do. So um, <clears throat> she's at this window. She's yelling at Jehu uh, about Zimri. And Wanda, yes, she obviously knows what's, what's going on and what had happened at this point. So does anyone have any comments or questions? Possibly, I, I don't remember back that. Was it said, was it, did Jezebel know that her time was coming? It was on a, she was on the clock because of what they did to Naboth. Naboth. That's possible, and I just don't remember. She may have. But there's no doubt she got word of Jehu killing um, Joram and Ahaziah. And that had already, that had already uh, made it um, into the city. And when Jehu comes into the city, she's adorned. She puts her makeup on, fixes her hair, and she's standing out a window, and she yells at him uh, in regards to Zimri and what Zimri did to his king and to his master. Anyone else? Anyone? Did you have your hand up, anybody? Anybody? Okay. All right, stay with me. Don't fall asleep on me. We're going to stop there tonight. Um, this is a fantastic story. I love it. This is great. And um, next week, when we come back together, uh, I encourage you to read chapter 10. Um, as we get into chapter 10, there are going to be things that we read that are going to be shocking to you, shocking to us, in regards, to, in regards to Jehu and his slaughter of Ahab's dynasty. And we're going to read things. You're going to go, oh my gosh, that's terrible. But listen, to the people that were under the rule of Ahab, that was a relief to them. There was freedom. And uh, there was, there was, a, there was a, a, no doubt a, a relief for these people to, to not be under the hand of of Ahab and his dynasty any longer so to be rid of that anybody any comments thoughts or questions all right let's go ahead and pray father we thank you for our time together tonight I pray that you would uh, grant us safety as we depart from here as we go to our homes 
Uh, Lord, give us safety as we travel, and uh, we look forward to bringing us back together, Lord, Sunday morning, where we can worship you uh, together as the body of Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you, and have a great rest of your week. Mm-hmm.